Now Josh Allen welcomes in Amari Cooper as the Bills make a blockbuster trade, picking up the uh, elite wide receiver, a number one in Amari Cooper from the Browns. And it was just an hour or two after the New York Jets announced that they had sent a conditional third rounder for Devontae Adams. Two huge wide receiver trades. And on now to talk pass catchers, blockbuster trades, and all of the sorts, our favorite guy, our general manager, Mike Tannenbaum. Mike T, man, your phone's been buzzing, I'm guessing, for the past uh, few hours. Yeah, what an exciting uh, today. Uh, AFC East and a whole bunch of receivers, Theo. What, what a day. Is it? I, I've been making this claim since the summer, Mike T. I, I've been saying since what I saw what teams did in the draft and also I saw what teams did on the open market and free agency, wide receiver is clearly the second most important position in the NFL. A- am I right on this now? Because I'm seeing two contenders make win-now moves getting receivers, and I saw how much draft capital they put into receivers in the draft as well. It's getting there. And, you know, the old argument was like, hey, supply and demand, you don't need to pay those guys. Uh, because, you know, there's so many out there. But clearly now you're right, you know, where they're going in the draft, how they're getting paid. And then we just saw two premium receivers get traded, you know, before the trade deadline. So, you know, we're in a league now where it's about, you know, the passer, protecting the passer and scoring points. And that's clearly the job description of uh, these receivers. Now, Mike T, you've been in that seat before as a general manager of the Jets, as a vice president uh, with the Dolphins. You, you have – two teams that were playing in primetime on Monday Night Football and literally less than 12 hours since they left that field, we have, or I guess about 14 hours since they left that field, we have two blockbuster trades announced. How soon in the week do you think these deals were actually worked out and was announcing them just more so about separating themselves from last night's final? I I made trades from games. I mean, I've had guys on planes when guys got hurt and we had to do workouts. Um, It's it's 24-7. And if I'm Joe Douglas, the GM of uh, the Jets, and I saw that performance last night, I knew that I had to go box out the Bills or the Ravens or whomever, everybody else, you know, on, you know, the situation with Devontae Adams, Theo. I'm calling him from the box saying, hey, man, I'm calling you after the game, and on this next call, we're getting this deal done. Mike, see, do you remember uh, any specific trades that you worked out, like literally in transit or in an uh, awkward spot? Uh, where people wouldn't expect the GM to be working the phones and making deals? Yeah, unfortunately, it was uh, uh, one year we lost Chad Pennington to a bad injury in a preseason game, and we had called two teams at halftime and had somebody actually fly in by the end of the game for a workout. So um, <laughs> it wasn't for you know reasons we felt great about, but yeah, um, it happened probably three or four different times in my career. Wait, was that wait during the when he got hurt in the game or a different game? Yeah, I. I no, it was a preseason game against the Giants. He had like a wrist fracture, and we knew it was serious. So um, at, at halftime, I was working the phones knowing that we were going to need, you know, another another quarterback. NFL don't stop for nobody. They say next man up. Next man up. That's how it yeah. works. Yeah, especially when you lose your starting quarterback uh, in a preseason game for uh, an extended period of time. It's It's a – it's a sickening feeling to be candid. Were you bedside with Pennington? Like, hey, Chad, who do you think would fit with this offense? <laughs> like, we want your input on this. Did he have any input or no? <laughs> well, just, you know, to take you behind the scenes, like you're speaking to, you know, his wife, his agent, and you're making sure that they feel like, hey, they're getting first-class care. And at the same time, like, you're scouring for options because, you know, the show goes on. So it's, you know, you're, you're kind of having, you're bifurcating your feelings between doing right by a player that you care deeply about and you want to be a first class organization. And then on the other side of it, it's like, shit, like what are, what are our options and you know, what can we do to get better? Mike Tannenbaum joining us here on theoretically speaking on a Tuesday, uh, 23, 20, the bills won last night. Both teams felt the fix for their franchise that they chase a super bowl is to go out and get a wide receiver. Which wide receiver do you think makes the biggest impact this year though, with Amari Cooper going to the bills and Devontae Adams going to the Jets. Oh, it's Cooper. You know, really because the Jets have a number one in Garrett Wilson. You know, the Bills really, you know, as you, the great lead in you, you had there, Theo, like Khalil Shakir really was their leading receivers. After Stephon Diggs, they, they're playing really good football. They're running the ball great. Josh Allen's Josh Allen. But Amari Cooper is a massive upgrade over what they had, whereas the Jets are adding to what's already a good position for them. I'm looking at the this stat right here, Mike T. I'm like, okay, it says here 
Teams that start the season two and four have a 26% chance of making the playoffs based on the history of the National Football League. Then I look at the AFC and I see an open door for both the Jets and the Bengals to claw their way back into the fight. If you had to put your hard-earned money on one of those two teams to actually make their way into the postseason after starting off two and four, who do you think is better positioned? I said it last week. It was the Bengals. I think Joe Burrow's playing really good football. And, you know, you have two A receivers in Higgins and Chase, and it's just hard to match up with those guys. So I think their defense is young, especially in the secondary. You know, they lost Dax Turner, but uh, DJ, um, they lost Dax Hill. DJ Turner stepped up for them. Um, I think if they could get Hendrickson playing at the same level he was a year ago with Hubbard, I think Cincinnati could really make some noise this year. Yeah, you said Joe Burrow's playing good football. What did you see from him on Sunday night? Because only scoring 17 points in that Sunday yeah. night football game, strutting his strut, even though the Giants defense has been pretty good this year. What did you see in that Sunday night football game? Yeah, uh, what I like, well, first of all, you know, longest run of his career. So it shows you um, what he can do, you know, with his legs. Obviously, he's not going to be you know, Lamar Jackson, but um, it just felt like, when he wasn't pressured, he's getting the ball out really with great anticipation, good accuracy. And again, credit the Giants because I thought the Giants did a good job of Brian Burns in particular had a good night. But when he's been protected this year, guys, I, I think he's um, the wrist surgery. Like I was concerned whether or not that was going to impact him. I, I don't see any sort of like flaws in his game relative to how he's throwing it. Mike T joining us here on Theoretically Speaking, talking Jets, Bills, making blockbuster trades at wide receiver. Uh, what what do the Jets need to fix then to make you more convinced that they can be a team to make the playoffs? They got the run game back going with Brees Hall, though it seems like many of people are able to get their run game going against the Bills. Um, and also, defensively, they kept the Bills in check for most of that second half. What, what do you think is the flaw for them that's going to hold them out of the postseason? I think it's stopping the run. You know, you go back to opening day, you know, no Christian McCaffrey. Jordan Mason, you know, has a huge game last night. No James Cook. And, you know, Ray Davis, a fourth-round pick out of Kentucky. So they're small. You know, Jamie Sherwood, small. Quincy Williams, small. Um, that, that, to me, is their vulnerability. You know, they play Pittsburgh Sunday night, guys. Take mm. the under. I mean, they'll run it every play. I mean, Arthur Smith and Mike Tomlin, they'll run it every single play. And – if you can't stop the run, guys, there's no worse feeling in football because it's just, you know, body blow after body blow. And, and that, to me, is, is a flaw that the Jets have to fix. Speaking of those Steelers, Mike T, we saw reports that Russell Wilson going to be taking first-team snaps, though Justin Fields is 10 total touchdowns, only one interception so far, and has Pittsburgh out to a 4-2 and two start. Uh, is this, like, are, would you make that kind of a move this deep into the season and, again, putting Russell Wilson out there for his first game of the season against that Jets defense. I think uh, what you're looking at in that situation is, you know, typically the game of football comes down to six or seven plays in a game that, you know, one team executes and the other doesn't. And I think Tomlin's sitting there and saying, you know what, like we just can't hit home runs. You know, like we're, we're, we're moving the ball. Justin Fields has been okay. But what's one thing Russell Wilson can do? He can hit the home run. He can get the ball deep. And now the question is, do, you know, the Steelers have the people on the outside to get there, you know, beyond George Pickens, which is a fair question. But I think that's what Coach Tomlin's probably thinking about with this move is, let's see if we can get the deep ball as part of our offense. Is there a world in which the Browns actually consider moving Miles Garrett or even the Raiders consider moving Max Crosby? Because it does seem like those teams' future this year is going to be bleak. But those two guys feel such a like they're like cornerstones of those franchises. Yeah, like you know, the rule of thumb is if you get multiple first round picks, you got to consider it. You know, either team's going to get to where they want to go in all likelihood this year. So if I could get two ones, you know, if Detroit overpays for one of those guys because they think they could go win the Super Bowl, I think that's something you know both teams need to consider. What would you do in that seat right there, man? You lose Aiden Hutchinson. You're the Lions. You're off to a prolific start. You were in the NFC Championship game last year. You were one game away, and now you lose your prolific pass rusher. Are you making a move before the deadline if you're in Detroit? Yeah, I'm calling up the Cleveland Browns saying, like, we are acquiring Miles Garrett. I'm going to send you the paperwork. 
uh, we're just paying the bill. We're not negotiating. <laughs> so whatever the bill is, we're gonna we'll just pay it. And uh, thank you very much. Do you actually see tra- trades like that in the NFL, where it's literally an offer that a team who can't ref- refuse the first offer on the table is overwhelmingly got to say yes? Doesn't happen a lot, but you know, I think that that could be a situation. Like, who would say no to Miles Garrett for three ones? Mm. Like Detroit. I mean. You look at Detroit and you say they have a realistic chance to win the championship with Miles Garrett. And for the city of Detroit, would they mind overpaying by a first-round pick? And if you're Cleveland, you're going to need a quarterback. You're going to need to rebuild. You hate to lose Miles Garrett, but if you get three ones, isn't that something you got to consider? Man, it's a tough, tough day for Clevelanders. You, you come off of Ohio State getting dropped against Oregon. You got the Guardians losing to the Yankees last night, and then not only do you have that decrepit franchise trotting out Deshaun Watson still, and they're defending that move, you also you also just lose Amari Cooper, and and and, and Mike T's out here pontificating about you losing Miles Garrett. Like, what would they have the root for left in the city? <laughs> well, Guardians could come back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. I guess it's not over. I guess it's not over. Yeah. Mike, Mike T, appreciate your time, man. We'll catch up with you next week, and uh, and and again, look. Next time you're negotiating a guy's deal, getting a new quarterback in there where Pennington's still hurt, man, you know, at least at least send him some flowers, too. You know, you got to be nice with those things. Hey, we paid like $64 million. That's better than flowers. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely correct. Appreciate you, Mike T. That's uh, All right, guys. It, this guy knows. This, this guy knows. This guy knows what to do in those kind of situations. Mike Tannenbaum's appearance is here on Theoretically Speaking, always brought to you by Eisner Ampner. And uh, you, you felt – I actually wasn't – so surprised that they were working on a deal for a new quarterback? Because what else is the general manager supposed to be doing during a football game if you see a big move like that happen on the field? Like, it's not like he's calling plays. The body's not cold yet, man. Like, I would wait till the maybe after the game, just post-game. Just wait till after the game. Yeah. You drive home from the game, start thinking about it. But that's incredible. Yeah. Just yeah. at halftime preseason game, Chad Pennington gets hurt and you're already making a deal for his replacement, that blew me away. I wonder how soon after Antonio Brown took off his Bucks jersey and ran off the field <laughs> that the Bucks GM started looking for a new receiver. Like, was that instantly because there's no, like, body's cold, but... Do you think he was monitoring him on the field said, oh, the jersey came <laughs> off, all right, on the phone. <laughs> so that's it, that's get, it. Get me a GM. That's get somebody. It. Oh, man.